How long have you been webcasting? Uh, since I started DTLT, which was in July. So a couple months. <laughs> so had you played with Wowza or Ustream or anything like that prior? I had I had played with Ustream before, just, you know, the free services. This was my first foray into the Wowza type stuff. So we started... I don't think we didn't start with WoW. So when we started DTLT today, we were just in TV. Yeah, we were using just in TV because out of all of the um, services, that was the least intrusive ads. Right, and that is the joy of Wowza. Uh, no ads. Right. right. Uh, and exactly. we're gathered here today to have the wizard of Wowza share his wisdom of uh, how because I I now. I guess you can buy your own Wowza server if you want, right? You can. Uh, it's a, it's software that you would run on a server, so you'd still need to buy your own hardware for it. But it is software that you can install and pay for a you know one license fee to run it on a server in house. Of course, then you deal with your own bandwidth and things that come along with that as well. So, and that's um, kind of a bunch of money, hundreds of dollars, right? Yeah, the server. I think um, we would have gotten an academic discount, so they quoted us something like seven or eight hundred dollars. I think it's retails like nine hundred. So, and is that a license forever or? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that was a one-time license fee for that version of the software, and then they had other options in terms of if you wanted to uh, pay on a monthly basis, you could buy a monthly license for I think it was. $50 a month and you'd be entitled to any updates that came down the pipe and that kind of thing too. So they have several different models and for pricing and things like that. Now they even have um, a daily license. So you could technically download the software, put it on your server, get everything set up, and then you could just pay a $5 a day license fee for when you were actually doing the streaming. So for a university that would work out really well if they were just doing an inauguration or something like that. Right. And that's the option that I uh, heard you guys talking about. And I, I said, that sounds great. And it's so I went to Amazon EC2 and I purchased this particular kind of server and it's five dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And then you pay per when it's when it's running. And Correct. that's something like 15 cents an hour. Right. Uh, and it comes with as much bandwidth and power as most simple web webcasts would need if you you know, want to stream Lady Gaga, you can pay a little bit more and right. and upgrade. So I got that. I read my basic documentation and said, oh, oh, okay, that goes, <laughs> right. okay, that long thing goes here. And I then I thought, well, I could spend 10 hours trying to figure this out and not quite get it right. Or I could ask Tim to come show me how he's made it happen. So uh, sure, that's what I'm looking forward to. So whenever you're ready, Go ahead. And is there anything that you're going to – I'm hoping we can screen share and see – That's what I was thinking. Maybe I should do. share my screen yeah. so I can is log there any, in and If there's any secure that. stuff that you don't want streamed or recorded, let me know and we be. can um, look other or, uh, look it elsewhere. Should, All right. Yeah, it shouldn't be. Let me try sharing my screen. When I go to um, – let's see. Share my desktop and I'll minimize that. And then – so I'm going to go to aws.amazon.com, which is the Amazon Web Services, which includes the EC2 stuff in addition to several other cloud-based services. Um, and they're adding more stuff all the time. And a lot of it's very developer-friendly, which obviously makes it very difficult for people like you and I that <laughs> want something a little easier to understand. Um, but anyway, I'll sign in here, and I don't care if people know my email address, and it should hide the password, so I'm not sure. Genial. What it. a lovely Gmail address you have. You like that. Yeah. <laughs> How can you not like that? Yeah. So um, so all these tabs up the top are all the different products that Amazon offers with their cloud-type stuff, and it's everything from cloud-based storage um, to... Lord, even uh, SMS service, so for sending text messages on a large basis and, and you know, all these different cloud-based services. EC2 is the one that we are using, and that is basically, it's similar to like a virtual machine. So you're, you're subscribing to these instances, they call them, and you can fire up this virtual server that's running this instance of a particular piece of software, or it can just be there's instances out there 
<clears throat> that people have set up that are just basic Linux boxes. And you could fire up an instance, you could install WordPress on it, and play around with it. And it's basically like your own little virtual private server running in the cloud, so to speak. Um, but what you subscribe to, that Wowza thing, gives you the access to fire up a virtual server that already has Wowza installed on it. So they've already installed and configured it with the basic configuration options. Um, and that's what... Um, we do as well. Now one thing I'll point out, there's two different things that we use. We use the Wowza instance and then we use another product from Amazon called an Elastic IP address. And that's also in this same tab because it's part of their EC2 offerings. There's all these different options on the left hand side here. Um, to go through them you've got your instances and I don't really understand the whole thing about spot and reserved instance. Is the uh, Elastic IP required to do this or it's just an add-on that you it, chose to... It, it's a convenience. So the thing about instances is that they're completely ephemeral. So as soon as you terminate it, it's gone, and you're not going to get the same IP address if you launch another one in the future. So what that means is when you go to broadcast, you have to change your IP address on the broadcasting thing. You have to change your Flash player to say which IP address it's looking for. Uh, so it just made it more convenient for me to be able to say, just give me this IP address that always stays the same. So then I don't have to reconfigure the website that's looking for the broadcast, the broadcasting system that we're using. All that stuff gets to stay the same. Yeah, that's a biggie. That would be a hassle to have to recreate sure. the watch page every time. Yeah, and it's really simple to do. So you go under Elastic IPs and you just say allocate a new address. Um, in terms of cost, I, everything's sort of nickel and dime, but it's a penny per hour that it's not in use. So anytime that it's actually assigned to a server, they don't charge you at all for it. But when it's just sitting there dormant, they charge you a penny per hour. What that ends up coming out to for us is something like $7 a month to get that static IP address. And that just allows us to keep that address 24 7 i can anytime i fire up an instance i can then say this ip address pointed to that instance so then i don't have to change my other stuff if you were to create any other instances let's say you wanted to run a wordpress or something like that could you point it to the same ip or each instance would point would, to a different ip you think i would imagine they couldn't run at the same time but you could absolutely um that ip address is yours to use for whatever instance you want in fact, it's a step in the process that once you fire up an instance, then you have to go into the Elastic IP section, and you would right-click it and say associate it with a specific instance. So there's okay. a drop-down, and it says what's running right now. I don't, I don't have any running right now. If I did, I could just assign it and say, yes, now associate it with that instance. Okay. And then it usually takes a, you know 20 seconds for it to take, and then I could start broadcasting or doing whatever I want with that IP address. So... Let's go in here under instances, and I'll show you. Um, so I don't have any running. If I did, this would show a list of all of them. Larger companies have multiple instances running all the time. Uh, but for the purposes of streaming, I just fire up when I need it, which is the beauty of it not costing too much. Um, if I say launch instance, and this is where you can see that there's actually a whole lot of different types of instances already available to people. Different Linux servers are on this list. There's Windows servers. Um, so if you ever want to play with that kind of stuff, Amazon actually offers some uh, free instances for people who have just started signing up and want to play with Amazon Web Services. And any of the ones that have these stars here, those are on what they call a free tier. So you can just you can fire those up and play around with them, and it doesn't cost you a dime. Uh, usually they're just very basic uh, Linux servers that you can, you know, access, install stuff, and play around with. But, you know, for a free virtual private server that's running in the cloud, it's kind of fun to do. It, could you, Like if you had a simple little blog, could you use that to run your blog for free? You could. Now, I mean, again, this is sort of technically advanced stuff. So <laughs> it, it's one of those things, do you really want to become your own sysadmin? But right. you could certainly do that. And there are even, uh, I found there is a company called Bit Something. I'm trying to think. It's not big gravity, but um, anyway, they they offer actual Linux boxes that already have WordPress and PHP and MySQL and everything set up on there. So then those you fire up, and there's not even a whole lot of install and configuration to go. But the nice thing about those free tier ones is those can run 24-7 for free. So it's not like you're having to use the Elastic IPs and you start and stop and do all that stuff because they're free for a year. 
So it's a it's a good introduction to some of their services, and w we can find a link here. Um, but Amazon has a page that details what their free tier stuff is and what it offers. So, okay, uh, we can find that another time if you want. Let's uh... sure. Let's keep going. So, yeah. um, so there's the quick start ones. There's my AMIs, which I don't actually have any. That's I guess if you create your own images and want to upload them and set them up there. But if you go to the community AMIs. And what I do here, it's going to load like this 30,000 sub list of images that they have on the thing. But what I usually do is I just type Wowza in here and give it a second to narrow down the list to just the Wowza instances or the ones that say Wowza in them. Could you save this to my AMIs? And... You know, I've, I've looked for that and I haven't seen an option oh, okay. to actually save it. So it would save me a step, I guess, but I haven't found it yet. If you do, let me know. Um, but anyway, what I do here is I sort it by their name and I scroll down and usually what I've done 3.0 so there's different versions too so you can run older versions of it if you needed to um, and I go through here and so what this is is these are the Wowza Media servers uh, with their specific version number and then x86 64 and i386 so that's 32 or 64 bit server um, the 3.0 version I haven't played around with yet um, in terms of what it offers there wasn't a whole lot to us that made a whole lot of sense. It's more for larger companies that want to add like digital rights management um, to, uh, to, to do and other things that really didn't apply to me. So I've still just been playing with the 2.0 version. Um, so 2.2.4 is the most recent one. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't even gone to the 64 bit. I've been, I've been using the i386 version. So this does one it right make here, a difference? Is there a difference in price or functionality? There's no difference in price um, in terms of functionality. I guess if you were having problems in terms of um, CPU usage and things, maybe the 64 belt bit might help a little bit. But mm -hmm. um, we have yet to even come anywhere near having issues like that. So I've always just stuck, stuck with what I know works. So i386 is the one that I've been going with. So I'm going to select that. You can choose if you want a preference on availability. Um, and these are all East Coast servers, and uh, they have different ones. I usually just say no preference here. Um, I just let it choose whatever it wants. And instance type up here, this is what you mentioned. The low instance is the least costed one, and then there's a high CPU one. Like you said, that would be if I was broadcasting a Lady Gaga concert, I would need like a bulky type server to run this. But if you're even if you were broadcasting to 100 or upwards of 200 people, I think you'd be okay if it's not like a 1080p stream. So um, we always just go with the small one, which works out fine, and that's like 15 cents an hour to run it. All of this stuff, I keep completely the default. So these are just advanced things for how you want memory allocated and other monitoring type tools that Amazon offers. I just don't even deal with that stuff. Key pairs, um, this is something that you can c completely skip as well. Awesome. So far, I'm yeah. liking this. I got it so far. Right. Now this key pair, so I'm sorry, that was another instance details one. The key pair, what this is, is if you want to be able to FTP into this server or SSH into it to make changes, the way that they authenticate against it is not with a user ID and password. It's with a user ID and this key pair. Um, so if you plan on wanting to do that, what you would need to do is just check here to create a key pair. You would give it some sort of name and then you would say create and download. It's an actual file that lives on your computer. If you lose that file, you have to generate a new one. Okay. So it's a, it's a security type thing, and most FTP programs will support this. It's a um, certificate file, and that's how you authenticate to it. So you would put the IP address of the server, and then you would point it to this um, to the specific file, and then you can log in as the root user. How much so do you need to securely connect to the instance? Um, the only time I've done it is when I've been playing with specific Wowza type things that I know that they offer, but that aren't configured by default. For example, if you wanted it to automatically record on the server, that's something I've been playing around with. Uh, that's a setting that I have to change on the server. If I want to turn on the ability for it to monitor how many people are watching the stream, that's something that you have to go in and configure ahead of time before you start streaming. And that's something that, you know, you would have to go in there and adjust some things. Okay. So. It's a good thing to just create a key pair. I keep it in my Dropbox and just keep it available to me. And then you can always go back. You can see it has me choose from my existing key pairs. 
Um, and so I can go in here and say, all right, this is the key pair that I have in my Dropbox. Just in case I think I'm going to need to use it, that's the one that I'm going to choose for this instance that I'm about to start, right? So let me continue here. Security groups. The way a security group works is so anytime you're running server type software, it's, it's going to want to know what ports that you want to have open. Um, and so what I've done is I've created this security group. And if I went to create a new one, you would give it a name and then you would set a whole bunch of rules. And this is basically your firewall type stuff. I need this range of ports to be open for whatever. Um, Wowza, let me pull up their guide real quick to show you. There's a specific setting on there where it tells you all this information. Um, so they have this large PDF user guide. And I've seen they that. Have, and they did have an HTML version. I don't see the HTML one for the version 3, but I imagine even if I go in here and just search um, ports. Yeah, so here you go. It says we need to open up several TCP and UDP ports, and it walks you right through this. Select security groups, new one, inbound, custom TCP rule, the port range, and all that stuff. So you would just go through here, and you would add rules for each of these things, port 80, port 443, all of these things. And so what you, what's nice about that is since you're setting it up in a group, once you've done all of this and given it a name, you can just select that security group the next time you go to fire it up, and it'll open all those ports and set everything up automatically. So that's what I do in here. The default is the default ports. If I did that, I wouldn't be able to stream because those ports wouldn't be available okay. in DTLT today. So this is a big step. This is a make or break it, step. Yeah, they, initially. Yeah, you, you want to make sure when you're firing up the instance that you choose this. The one time that I wasn't able to broadcast, it was because I forgot to switch over to from the default. And you can't mm -hmm. delete the default security group <laughs> or make the DTLT today when a default that I found. So... You just want to make sure that you've selected that security group that allows you to do that. And, and I'm sorry, can, can we look at create a new security group again? Sure. Is... So what it is, you so, give it a name, you, yeah. you can give it a description if you want, and then these are the inbound rules. So this is what can communicate with the server. Okay. And they've got different options here for TCP, UDP, SSH. That was one thing that I had to add to the security group. And you can go back in and add other ports later. Um, for example, so you can uh, edit a security group once it's created. You can. you can, yeah. In the Amazon settings, you can set, you can create, um, or you can edit the existing ones. Because when I first set it up, I didn't set up SSH because I thought I don't, I don't probably need that. And then later, I was like, well, I kind of do, and I had to open up port twenty-two for that. So I just added that one port into that same security group, so I didn't have to change anything else. So you would just say, for example, all TCP traffic normally you wouldn't do you don't have to open a port and you add that rule and then it throws it in there or you might say custom rule port 80 source is always going to be the same so you add okay source is always just the zeros as far as i know yeah okay um and again the, the guide will walk you through some of yeah. this um in terms of what rules you have to do uh, but it's it's a one-time thing to get all that stuff set, and then after that, you just get to choose that Great. security group and continue on. That's the last thing you have to do. So it, it reviews all these settings that you have available, and then you hit launch. And then what it's going to do is it's going to literally start booting up the server. So if I close the screen, you'll see on the instance list, now it's thinking, and your status says pending. Once this goes green and says now running, then it's running. And then the last thing we'll have to do is actually assign that IP address before it'll be capable of streaming too. And so I'll show you how to do that once it's booted up and then we'll get on to how you broadcast to it and how you view it because those are the two other steps of the process. This one has been pretty painless so far. It's just you know setting yeah. up those uh, security settings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I, I, w once you initially get the thing configured, it literally takes me just a few seconds to log into Amazon, boot up a server, and then I'm back to, you know, going to my other computer and actually doing stuff or doing it from the same computer. It doesn't really take that long to boot up the server. The thing you want to remember with this is that you remember to stop the server when you're done. <laughs> or you're going to be paying last a lot of 15 cents. Exactly. Yeah, you you don't want to come back the next day or over the weekend and find out you forgot to shut it down. So then that's several dollars you add on to the cost of it. So uh, yeah, if it's not terminated, then it's still running. And again, 
anytime you're playing around with those settings, like if you go into SSH or if you FTP into there and start playing around with that stuff, that kind of stuff doesn't get saved, unfortunately, with the instance. There's uh, some things available online that talk about different tweaks that you can do to allow you to stop a server instead of actually terminating it, but it allow it requires you to add on it extra things that cost money and stuff like that. So most of the setting changes you'd be doing here are completely ephemeral. If you want to be able to configure and run your server, you know, with all these settings all the time, then you need to look at something like running your own server with an actual license for it. Because I had looked at this for web hosting, and it just was so scary because it's so easy to nuke the whole thing. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, and it, well, in some of the instances are not like that, in that you can stop them and start them, and they keep all of your settings. The Wowza one in particular doesn't do that because if it's stopped, you're still paying the per minute or per hour fee. So you you know, and so in fact, when I go here, my only options are to reboot it or to terminate it. So it's always sort of running, even even if it was to crash, it could start right back up and the settings would be there. But if it terminates, then everything's gone because they've actually completely killed the server. It doesn't exist anymore. So, all right, so now it's okay. running. We got the green light there. Um, and you can see if when it's clicked on, you can actually scroll down here, give it a second to load. And it'll tell you everything about it in terms of what IP address it has, um, what the DNS address is. So this is a publicly available one. In fact, a nice thing to know about this is that if you were to take this DNS address, and Wowza runs on port 1935. So if you take that address and then you add colon 1935 to make sure it's running, it will just tell you what the name of the server is and what version or what build number it is and that kind of thing. So that's how you know a server is actually running. Very good. Um, I have to go in here and I'm going to assign my IP address, which is just as simple. Like I said, if you didn't have one, you would allocate a new one and it would say, here's your IP address. And then you just right click that address and say, associate it, ask you which instance and you choose for me, the only one that's actually running. They give instances, these odd characters and numbers. And then I say, associate it. And so now it will apply that static IP address to the server. Usually from the time that I do that, it takes about 30 seconds before I can start broadcasting. Just takes it a minute for everything to resonate, I guess, with all the server and everything like that before I could start specifically okay. broadcasting to that IP address. But at that point, you're done with Amazon Web Services. Like it's running in the background and it's ready to do whatever it wants to do. Um, I'll show you the other easy part before I get to the hard part. How about that? Sounds good. So we'll work our way up next, to it. The next part of this is how do you actually broadcast to it? Uh, and there's a few different programs that are available that can broadcast to Flash me media servers. If you're running a Mac only, then there is one program you can use called QuickTime Streaming Server. And let me see if I even have that one on here. I don't use it, uh, but QuickTime Streaming Server. It's a free download for Macs. And it's, it is only Mac. This one is Mac only. Uh, they, there's another cross-platform one I'll show you in a minute. But the nice thing about this is the user interface is kind of nice. So it's a free thing that you just download this QuickTime broadcaster, and then you would put in the IP address. Um, in fact, if it doesn't take too long, I'll download in the background, and we'll come back to it um, just so you can see what it looks is like. Is there any reason you're but not it, using this? Uh, the reason we're not using it is because we use paid software that's a little bit nicer. Okay. So I'll show you. I'll show you that, but it's fairly pricey. It's called Wirecast. I don't know if you've ever played around ah, with it. Ah, yeah, but that lets you have some serious fun. It, yeah, it, it's a really nice piece of software, and luckily um, our department was able to have, um, get it, and so we went ahead and bought it because it lets us be a lot more flexible in what we're broadcasting and how we do it. Now, that's Mac free. only also, right? Uh, they have a Windows version. They do. But it, yeah, so they have a Windows and a Mac version. So, and that's kind of like your TV studio, go from one camera to the other camera, zoom in kind of thing, right? Exactly. It can take multiple inputs. It can look at desktops that are on your network. So you can run a little piece of listener software on another computer entirely, and then it can get that desktop and audio. So it's good for Skype interviews where you have another computer running all of that. Um, it does the green screen stuff for us, so that works out well. And um, so How much yeah, does that cost? 
that is for the basic version i believe it's 499 so and there's a pro version that's like 900 dollars. so i think with the academic discount it comes to like 350 so it would definitely be for someone who is serious about webcasting not just someone who is looking to do this um in just an academic setting here or there it would be someone who was going to do it all the time and wanted to do some really fancy stuff with it but for what it is the interface is extremely nice even the windows version <laughs> but um it's a really nice piece of software um but again it's not free quicktime broadcaster is so um that's something to do let me install this real quick because i don't think this should take too long and then i'll show you what this one looks like um while I'm installing this, I'll tell you the other free version. Oops. The other free piece of software that's available is actually by Adobe. It's called Flash Media Live Encoder. Mm -hmm. And you may or may not have heard of that. That's a cross platform piece of software. It does work on Mac and on Windows. That's kind of where I, I stopped <laughs> with my Wowza yeah. adventure. It's like, oh, which sure. number has to go here? Right. So I'll pull that one up in a minute, but I will show you. Now, are you on Windows? I am. Okay. Well, for now. <laughs> for now. Um, let me show you the QuickTime Broadcaster just so you know that this is available and for people out there who might watch this later. There you go. All right. And I've got a little echo in my headphones, but that's probably from this thing. So if I showed the details in there, let me, all right, <laughs> had to uncheck the audio stream, so we're good now. Um, on the network tab here, this is where you can tell it, all right, I'm going to be streaming to a server. What's the host name? That's the IP address. Um, and this is going to be similar for the Flash Media Live Encoder, too. So, uh, for example, if I go back here, I can get the IP address that I use. And some of the specific settings for how this goes uh, is, again, in that PDF file that talks about it. But you've got your host name there. Your file name is mystream.stp. There are no username or passwords or anything. So it, that's literally, a, well, I take it back. 1935 is the port number, so you have to put colon 1935. Those two settings are basically all it takes. At this is the point, file name going to be like the the URL of the watch address, or is that going is. to be a file that's okay? It is, and usually I've been told that my stream is like the default file name, so most of them listen for it anyway. But it's good to go ahead and say it in there, and so um, you put that information in. So this is the address that the Flash player is going to be looking for when it's trying to receive that stream. Okay, and. And then QuickTime lets you choose exactly what kind of video settings you want here or audio settings. It's not letting me do video because it's using my webcam for the um, Hangout right now. But if, my, if I had a camera available, I could check off to enable the video stream and set up exactly how much compression I want in it, how big I want it to be, frames per second, all that good stuff. Okay, and I'll so, ask you about some of the specs you use when we get to the other encoder. Sure. Sure, but the biggest thing here is on the network. You just want to set it up to be streaming to a specific address with a file name. Um, right. That's pretty painless. And that's, yeah, and they give you this um, basic preview window here, and the nice thing about the QuickTime Broadcaster is that it'll auto automatically record to the disk, so you can be recording and broadcasting at the same time and just get that back up as well. Um, QuickTime Broadcaster... Uh, I believe the version that it saves to your hard drive is going to be a QuickTime format, whereas with the Adobe Flash Media Encoder, it's going to be a Flash file that it's going to save to your desktop. Let me quit that. Let's open up Flash Media Live Encoder. All right. No, thank you. All right. So it's warning me that you don't actually have a video camera hooked to it, but that's okay. Now, the Flash Media Live Encoder, one thing I'll point out is once you have the settings in here, you can save a profile. So you can always open that profile back up again on another computer. Anything that's running Flash Media Live Encoder can open that profile, and they're good to go. So that's something worth noting. Um, over here on the right-hand side, you'll see the Stream to Flash Server options, and you can see they've started filling out the address, but the address is localhost slash live. In you don't case, have a actually, profile saved? Uh, not on this computer because we ah. don't use Flash Media Live Encoder. So, oh, right. Uh, 
in this case, it's going to be our IP address slash 1935 and then slash live. And then the stream name is that mystream.stp. So what you can do here at this point is you can say connect and let's see if I get in there. Yeah. So now in the bottom it says connected. I'm connected to that flash media server, which, you know, that's wowza. So at this point, if I wanted to, I could start broadcasting. Of course, I don't have any video, but I do have audio. So if I started this right now, DTLT today would fire up and <laughs> they would just get my audio there. Um, but it is working because otherwise it would have given me an error here. That's kind of a nice thing that you can test out, making sure that you're connected to the server before you even worry about the video and the audio and all of that stuff. Um, here you have the save to a file. You can choose where it's going to save to, what the name of it is. Uh, if you wanted to limit it by size, you could do that as well. And I always check off this DVR auto record, which just means that it's going to automatically save it whether you remember to press the button or not. If you don't wow. check that off, then you actually have to press record and it'll record. So um, either way, again, this is going to save a flash video file, so FLV. Um, and which then, isn't very editable. It's not. Yeah, you're usually going to want to convert that to uh, your QuickTime format or something like that. So if you're on a Mac, that's, again, why I would say go for the QuickTime broadcaster right. because the file it saves is just going to be a little bit nicer. Here they've got some basic settings in here. Always broadcast H.264. It's just easier that way. <laughs> It means that uh, Wowza can transcode it for the iPhone and the iPad, and it's just a better file, in my opinion. So they've got some basic H.264 options here. Let's say I wanted a high bandwidth one. Uh, but you can also adjust those manually. Um, I can't choose the video setting here because I don't have a camera hooked to it. But, you know, basically your bitrate settings are um, kilobits per second. Uh, this is how much bandwidth you want the user to use. Um, now, you don't have, is it Wirecast on this computer? No, I do. I'll you pull do? that one up. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and then another thing that plays into your bandwidth is how high quality your audio is. Right. And you can choose multiple formats here. For the purposes of broadcasting to iOS devices, we use AAC for the audio. Um, and it can be stereo. It can be 44, 100 hertz. Uh, it, Bit rate can be 128. Uh, I'll check on my Wirecast settings to see what all of these are for us, uh, just so that you know. And then you can Does choosing AAC cause any problems for anybody? I haven't ran into any yet. Good. But, it, but it's definitely man mandatory for the server to be able to broadcast then out to iOS devices. So. And we want to be mobile friendly. Right. Yeah. So, well, it's nice to be able to do that. Um, and that's all you have to do. I'm already connected, so at this point I would adjust all of my settings and then I would just start broadcasting there. Uh, it would be good to go. Now, last but not least, uh, of our third option, we have Wirecast. And again, um, this is not a free pr piece of software, but out of all of the ones available, this one is the most user-friendly. It's also not a bad piece of software if you're using Ustream or Livestream or just in TV. So, um, up here, if I go into broadcast settings, one nice thing about Wirecast is that you can broadcast to multiple different places. So I could broadcast to my Wowza server, but if I wanted to do a Ustream stream as well, I could do that. I just have to hit this plus sign, and then I would just choose Ustream and enter my channel name and my username. Oh, that's great. Or like if you wanted to do a really low bitrate ice cast or something like that, you could do exactly, that simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah, so you can do multiple bit rates. Now, of course, the more things you add into here, the more intense your CPU is going to need to be. So uh, the more that you're asking it to broadcast out to these different things, it'll need um, a good network connection and a pretty good processor. So we do two here. We record to the desktop, or not to the desktop, but to a folder on the computer in a specific version, and then we broadcast to the Flash server. These are the settings that we have for our Wowza server. Um, it's not anything <laughs> private by any means, but basically uh, the encoder preset, you can see they have some basic presets for different things. And you can go in on a different screen that I'll show you and adjust what high bandwidth 16 by 9 actually means right. uh, in terms of, you know, how much bit rate, you know, what size it is, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and 
where our destination is an RTMP flash server. So that's basically a Wowza server. And again, there's our address. So it's the IP address, the port number, and then live is the name of the application. One interesting thing about Wowza is that you can have multiple streams running at the exact same time. They just have to have different application names. So if you were, for example, we're, we're hoping to get Wowza on a box here on campus at some point so we can run a 24 seven and we could set up separate applications for all the different things we wanted to do, DTLT today or something else, or if some professor wanted to use it, and they could be streaming at the same time we are. So you can have, have multiple problem. channels running on the same instance or the same Wowza server. Yep. Yeah, they, I mean, they all take bandwidth. They all take processing power. So again, you're talking a server that can handle all of that stuff, but they absolutely can, they can broadcast at the exact same time, and it wouldn't cause any problems. So... Um, and then the stream name, mystream.stp is in there. User agent, I don't worry about it. I use Wirecast stuff. Um, and then you're good to go. And then you hit save here. Now the recording one you can see is a different type of encoder. We, we record to disk a very uh, high quality 720p version onto the computer itself. But what we're streaming is a smaller version, you know, because people don't usually have the bandwidth to be able to pull down an HD quality stream. So that destination is recording it to disk, and you just choose where you want it to record, and it'll automatically increment the file name depending on which time you broadcast. So it'll add a one, two, three for whichever version it is. And I do not check hint for streaming server playback. Okay, so and you use a pre here. for your the one that you're streaming. You use that preset, the flash preset. I do the flash high bandwidth. high bandwidth, sixteen by nine, and I'll go in and show you. I did make a few adjustments to the default for Wirecast, uh, but you can almost see in there it says encode is H.264, it's nine sixty by five forty, and it's forty four point one kilohertz audio. Um, and if I cancel here and go over to the encoder presets, this is where you can see the specific information. So if I go to high bandwidth sixteen by nine. Here's the actual stuff. It's 960 by 540, 30 frames a second. It's actually a pretty high quality bit rate, so it's 1,000 kilobits per second. Baseline profile is required for broadcasting to iOS devices. Uh, and then the audio, again, is AAC audio, stereo, and I'm 96 kilobits per second on that. And so Yeah, I've never been able to see one of your live uh, webcasts because they happen like at 3 or 4 a.m. here. Uh, right. But, I, I mean, the recordings look beautiful. Uh, and that's a pretty nice quality stream. Uh, and that's going to, now that's also going to affect user connection as well, right? So if someone has a really slow connection, it's going to be challenging to watch DTLT in all its glory. Yeah. And the one thing that I've been trying to look at, and I just haven't had the time to really give it much of a go is that Wowza can do variable bit rate. It requires both setting up, uh, the main thing that it requires setting up is telling the server which bit rates to support, and then your flash player has to also support it. So there's some settings that I would have to do in there to basically say, can I do 300 kilobits? Yes, I can. Can I do 500? Yes, I can. Can I do 900? No, I can't. So it does that all on the fly, and the user doesn't really see the changes. You know, it just works for them. And if it can do higher, they adjust it automatically. And it's, you know, barely even noticeable for the user when it switches over to a higher bandwidth or a lower bandwidth, depending on what their network connection's like. I just haven't had time to play yeah, around. We with can it. cover that on The Wizard of Wowza Part 2. <laughs> if the wizard ever figures it out himself, right? <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, so those are my settings. Uh, at that point, you can see Wirecast has two buttons up here. It's broadcast and it's record. So if I hit broadcast... At that point, it fires up, and you can see they give me some statistics up here of what my data rate is, how much CPU usage I'm using, which it's a black screen, so not too bad. Uh, and then I could hit record here, and it's going to start recording that file to my desktop as well. What are the specs on this machine? This is a 15-inch Mac Pro. Uh, it's the i7 processor. So the I believe it's the higher-end 15-inch Mac, MacBook Pro, sorry, okay. uh, laptop. So. And then the hard drive on there, in terms of recording, we did the 7200 RPM, but we have on order one of the Thunderbolt drives, which should allow us to record even easier in terms of, you know, throughput to that. How much RAM? So, uh, this, that's a good question. I'll find out for you real quick. Four, Four. gigs. Mm. Yeah. So, and it's 2.2 gigahertz Intel Core i7. So, and we haven't had too many problems with stuttering. The only time we run into issues is if we're trying to play 
a video file from the same computer that it's recording to, which is why we're, we're, we had that Thunderbolt drive on order. We're going to record the actual stream to that external drive, and then we can play any media we want from the internal hard drive with no issues. Uh -huh. so, so that'll help a lot with throughput. And the Thunderbolt um, channel is, you know, as fast, if not faster, than solid state. So it'll work well. Um, so that's how you broadcast to the server. The other piece of it is the Flash Player. Right. The one that I use is called JW Player. This is just a basic Flash Player that you can download. The free version of it actually adds a little icon in the bottom of the screen, but you never see it because it shows up for about two seconds on the bottom left-hand side, and then it disappears. So for a free product... <laughs> I'm totally down with that. If you wanted to pay for it, I think it's $99 to have, like, the developer version of the Flash player that you can install with no. Yeah, I think I can give them some props for a couple seconds. Right. <laughs> yeah, so um, the nice thing about this, I actually found, let me search here. Wowza, EC2. Longtail is the name of the company. This is how I found out about Wowza because they actually, on their blog, did a very good breakdown of how to actually do all of this that I'm talking about right now. And they talk specifically not just about the broadcasting portion of it and getting set up on EC2, but also how to set up their Flash player to do it. So it's a great thing oh, to nice. go and look at. Yeah, so I'll send you the link to that as well. Um, but it's a great thing to do. Basically what you need is you need a piece of JavaScript and you need the actual Flash player, which is an SWF file. And you're going to put those on your website itself. Uh, the best thing I can point you to would be, let's see. So now we've got to look at a little code here. This is a basic thing I set up for someone where we were doing a similar stream. And if I go in to view the source, scary stuff, but we can look at it. So the first part of it is that JavaScript file that's up here. Um, and you would just upload that to your server and then point it in the header of your HTML file. And then this is the configuration for the actual Flash player. And again, they talk a little bit about this in that blog post. But uh, basically, the, the Flash player has settings for the width, the height, uh, what image you want it to show when it's not playing. So we have this DTLT Today logo that shows up when, before you hit play. So you can upload an image and then put the URL for it in there. And then there's two separate streams here. This is one of the newest versions of JW Player that supports automatically switching depending on whether it's an iOS device or not. So there's two things here. They're saying if it's Flash, then this is the source, um, this Flash player. And then the, this is the IP address, slash live, slash mystream.sdp. But if it's HTML5, then you need the playlist.m3u8, which is an iOS-specific thing that says this is a QuickTime stream that I can watch. So these are all the settings that go into there. And again, they're in the blog post as well. You're just basically choosing how large you want that Flash player to be and where it needs to look for for that live stream. And then you insert that in your, in your site, and you're good to go. If you are broadcasting, it will automatically... Or, Actually, on here, I don't have it set to autoplay, but that is one of the settings for JW Player where you can say when someone goes to the site, automatically hit play for them. Um, and we do that on DTLT Today. So when we're not streaming, if you go to dtlttoday.com slash live, it just says, I couldn't find the server, <laughs> but it makes it better for when we are streaming because then they don't have to uh, accidentally forget to hit play or something like that. So. Right. And then you can and then you can choose up here the way this um, script works and the reason it needs that piece of JavaScript is it says if they don't have flash this is and and they're not on an iOS device that supports that HTML5 format show them this which is just an h2 tag that says this stream requires Adobe flash or an iOS device so you can choose what you want to show up there if they're not on a system that supports either flash or HTML5 probably not a large group of users I would think no so, <laughs> so especially for DTLT right <laughs> you'd think so yeah so and then you're done so the flash player lives on there this is what it looks like and then um, like I said if they hit play and it's not running or there's a problem you'll see the server not found and that just means you're either not broadcasting or there's something wrong of some kind it, it's looking for that server for a live stream and it's not getting it 
So it probably means there's a problem with the broadcast or um, because usually the Amazon EC2 stuff is pretty straightforward. This can happen if that port thing is not happening. So if you forgot to, to turn on the right security group or something, you would get the same message. So, but if it was broadcasting and running, then when we hit play, it would go. So, and that is it. There's, so there's three parts to it. There's the Amazon portion of it. There's the broadcasting piece of it. And then there's the flash player in it. I don't know which one's harder, probably either the broadcaster or the flash player, but the the nice thing about it is once you get the flash player all set up and you know it's working the first time, it'll work every time after that. I've never had to make any changes to the DTLT Today site right. after that. Now, if you didn't have that um, the IP, the Elastic IP in Amazon, you'd have to go into this code and change the IP every time, right? Exactly. So on the Flash Player, they say, where is the streamer? So it has RTMP uh, colon slash slash, and then it has an actual IP address. And on the broadcaster and on the Flash Player, they both ask for that specific address to point to. And that's where you would change those. So when you're still testing out, it's no problem for you to change them anyway. So you wouldn't really need it. But once, you're, once you know it's all working correctly and you want to be able to do it again and again and again, then you would go for the Elastic IP. Yeah. So... All right. Well, as I suspected, it was a lot easier to understand watching your show and tell than uh, <laughs> reading it's, those it's, long PDFs. It's very technical stuff, and but I mean, I'll say I'm a geek, but I'm not a developer. So I, you know, at the most, I play around a little bit with WordPress code, but I'm not a developer by any means. So it's not, it's not beyond the capability of someone to do. And I'm happy to answer questions and help. Um, I have no problem if people want to send me emails or. Uh, hit me up on Twitter or something. I'm happy to help them out with. Some and of and that you have, like you mentioned, you have a great blog post that kind of breaks this down already. Yeah. And now you have a show and tell video. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, we can't let you leave without plugging DTLT. Uh, where and when sure. can people tune in? Sure. Uh, DTLTtoday.com. Uh, the we broadcast every day, uh, usually around four o'clock if we're if we're on time or we're or we're able to do it at that time. So it's every day that we're in the office, Monday through Friday. So we've got seventy six episodes so far in running. So it's been quite a ordeal, and and we're hoping to have new shows fairly soon. We we're sort of modeling it off the Leo Laporte's Twit Network. So we we have other ideas for things that we want to do, but DTLT today will be the network itself that people can always go there to see what what things that we've done yeah great stuff i i enjoyed listening to them and uh, or watching them and uh next time i have insomnia i'll be tuning in live and thank you so <laughs> much this has been really helpful and uh, hopefully we'll be putting it to the test this weekend i think i know what all i'm right. going to be doing late night this week yeah <laughs> all right well hit me up if you have any questions <laughs> will do thanks very much tim all right thanks for having me bye